Hey, Blockhead Traders. Here at Blockhead Traders, I must inform you that we are not financial professionals. Nothing we say should be considered financial advice. We offer our own thoughts and opinions to you, the viewer. We expect you to take these opinions, make your own financial conclusions, and make your own financial decisions. Today is Thursday, June 29th, 2023, and this is Blockhead Traders Weekly. In this week's episode, it's just myself, Sprocket888, and I am going to cover a few topics here about uh, covered calls and really what is a covered call. And I'm going to touch on how it really is a low stress option strategy uh, that can be deployed. Uh, it's super beginner friendly and it is super boring. Uh, however, that often makes for a good entry type of trade. But before we hop to some of that content, I want to give a shout out to our Discord, link in the description below. You can hop in there, say hello to myself, Viper, several of the other blockhead traders. We'd love to hear what type of things you like to trade. We'd love to hear about what type of content you want to hear on this channel. You'll also find a link to thetagang.com forward slash sprocket888, where I post each and every one of my equity trades, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You can also pick up this audio podcast wherever you get your favorite podcasts and consume this to and from work or wherever it is that you're going. If you don't find it wherever you pick those up at, let us know and we will make sure we get it there. But let's hop to this week's content. And in this week's content, I wanted to, I was kind of thinking about what type of things should I cover on here? And I know we've covered um, covered calls before and we've talked about them and I presently have a covered call kind of going right now and it's been doing pretty well doing exactly what a covered call is supposed to do. And I started thinking about, you know, how beginner friendly that covered call actually is and how I'm at a point in that trade where it's going to be really difficult for me not to profit no matter what happens from that trade. And so I thought I'd take some time today to really walk through a covered call strategy. And um, I'm gonna, we're going to jump into my covered call, which is what I would say mid-wheel. Uh, so you might hear the term the wheel strategy. Uh, and what that is really all about is it is a naked put combined with a covered call. The way that works is you got two options products, a put and a call. So quick refresher here, uh, a put is the is a contract that is written and it gives the holder of the contract the right to put shares to the seller of the contract, which means they can force you to take the shares if you are the entity that wrote or sold the contract. A call is the exact opposite direction of a put. A call gives the person who holds the option the right to call away from the writer of the contract or the seller of the uh, option, can call those shares away or force that option writer or seller uh, to sell those shares of that particular underlying. And where does that actually come into play when we're talking about a covered call? And that really comes down to the two ways you have to enter the covered call. Now, um, I'll talk about what I do, but there's effectively two ways to get into a covered call. A covered call basically means you're selling a call, but you are covered on your risk because you own the shares that back up that call. So you could sell a call without owning any shares. That's referred to as a naked call. That is not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is you are the holder of 100 shares, at least 100. Um, options are sold uh, in batches of 100, so you have to have a incremental division of 100 of shares of something in order to sell a covered call. And all that means if you sell a covered call means you are selling a call on the market. You are writing that contract saying, "I, you can call away from me these shares uh, whenever you want until that option expires. And you're okay with that because you own the shares. And if they're called away from you, that person that you sold that contract to will purchase those shares for whatever strike price you sold that option for. Now, the way that you can start a covered call is either have the shares outright um, and, and sell the call, 
or if you don't have them, you can go buy 100 shares and then sell a call right away. That's the second bullet here that's listed. The first one is actually kind of like going through a phase before you can sell them is you need to get the shares. And one of the ways that you can get the shares is selling a naked put. What that means is remember a put gives the option buyer the right to put 100 shares to you. So if you sell a put, the person that bought that from you can put 100 shares to you and you have to buy them at whatever strike price you sold. And that's that's really what this uh, two ways to enter is you got to get 100 shares. So you can either just buy them from the market or you can acquire them from somebody assigning you 100 shares uh, after collecting some premium. Now, we're going to try to go ahead and talk about this in terms of how I trade a covered call and the approach that I make. And that's really going to start with how do I enter. So if we take a look at the steps that I follow when it comes to my covered call strategy, uh, this is really the, the, the five steps that I follow. The first thing I'm going to look for is I'm going to look for what do I want to own? Remember, in a covered call trade, you are going to own 100 shares of whatever it is that you're going to do. So you need to make sure that you want to own those shares and they're something that you're okay to hold with and your account has enough money uh, to hold those shares and to buy those. So first thing I'm going to do is look for the underlying. The types of things that I like to hold covered calls on are things that pay dividends, uh, big mega cap stocks, big blue chips, um, big like anchors in the market. That's what I like because those are going to be the, the type of things that um, you know hedge funds are investing in, mutual funds, index funds. They're going to be the high volume uh, types of stocks that are, are going to go kind of continuously up and to the right over a long period of time. Uh, I won't really get into much price action of where I'm coming into, but effectively the only thing I'm really looking for is a name that I like and a lot of volatility, which means the premiums are going to be high because the way that I enter them is I sell a put um, first and I wait to be assigned those 100 shares. So once I pick a particular underlying, in, in the example we're going to talk about today, it's Amazon. So Back uh, several months ago, I decided, you know, hey, I'm okay holding Amazon. Uh, it's kind of going down at the time uh, quite precipitously, which was really driving volatility up. So I said, you know what, I'm going to sell some of this volatility and I'm. it's cool if I get assigned these shares uh, because I'll be okay with it because I want to hold Amazon. And so I do what's called selling at the money or ATM uh, put. So if you look at the strike prices, and at the money is basically whatever put is trading closest to the share price at that time. So in the case of Amazon, I, uh, I, my strike price was $115. So when I entered the Amazon put trade, uh, Amazon was trading around $115 and I sold an at the money Amazon put. And that means that money that I collected goes straight into my pocket. I think in the Amazon's case, it was around $4.65 uh, for that put. And that immediately goes into my pocket. And what I do is I basically just roll that put. So that put expires. Um, usually I'm targeting about 35 to 45 days to expiration. And as we get close to expiration, if I have not been assigned, I will roll that put forward. And when you roll a put forward, when it's naked, uh, you will always collect more profit. And that's because there's almost no time left on the put that you're closing. You keep the same strike and you go out about a month in time. And that going out a month in time is going to be more time premium. So you're going to collect more premium coming in. Um, I can't remember the exact number of when I rolled, but in my Amazon, you know, I first collected $4.65, which is $465 because that's per share. It represents 100 shares. Uh, when I rolled it, I believe I rolled it for another $2 and some change uh, collecting more. And basically, I will keep doing that until the person that I sold that option to assigns me and puts 100 shares to me. At that point... 
I will now hold 100 shares of Amazon um, and they will be have purchased at that strike price. So in my case, 115. So I bought 100 shares of Amazon at $115. And you might think, dang, that's a lot of money. It's actually on margin. Uh, so the amount of buying power I actually needed to hold 115 shares was not uh, 115 times 100, uh, but more along the lines of 40% of that. So now I've got 100 shares of Amazon. What do I do? And this is where I look and I calculate all the premium that I've collected and I look to see what is my cost basis. Now your cost basis is what is the effective price that you bought those shares at. Well, I told you I paid $115 a share for those. That's true. However, I collected premium before I paid that $115 per share. And so that, you know, $4.65 plus another $2 lowers my cost basis by, you know, $2 or sorry, $6 and say 35 cents or, or whatever the summation of all that is, that lowers my cost basis. So in the case of Amazon, my cost basis was actually $106 and some change. You'll see it on the next slide. What that means is if I sold a call for, let's say, $110, I'm guaranteed not to lose money because if I get assigned at $110, my cost basis was maybe $106. I'm going to make that difference of $4 uh, or $400 in profit. And so the goal here is once you're assigned the shares, you have to know your cost basis. And to know that, you have to keep track of what premium did you collect. Now, I could have assumed uh, $115 was the cost basis and, you know, that extra profit, whatever, then I get to keep that uh, and then try to sell a call above $115. This is all up to your discretion. Um, typically, I am selling a put and getting a sign because there's a lot of downward bearish pressure. So sometimes you don't really get back up to selling those uh, calls that are really well above your cost basis all the time. And so I like to factor in all the premium that I collected to know what my real cost basis is to make sure that when I go sell those calls, I am definitely selling above that cost basis. Just like on the put side, I am going to then roll that call again and again and again until I am assigned. I will, I'm going, my goal is to make that option holder force my assignment. I'm not going to try to close that call out early. I'm going to take it all the way to expiration. If I close it early, it's going to be because I rolled it. So I'll kind of come in waiting for maybe a week or so before expiration, and I'm going to roll it. And again, when you sell options, you are going to always collect more credit because you are closing out or buying the option back that has almost no time left on it. And then you are selling the option that's farther out in time, which has more time premium. So that is a lot of uh, words and explanation. Uh, hopefully you're, you're tracking and following along here. Let's go ahead and move to some real numbers of where I'm currently at with my Amazon trade. So right here, we are wheeling with the Amazon. And remember that wheel is this continuous, you know, get a hundred shares, sell your call, wait for them to be called away, then rinse and repeat. So once I get assigned to have these shares called away from me, if I want to keep doing this on Amazon, I'm going to turn around and I'm now going to go back to the start and I'm going to sell that put again at the money and I'm going to roll it and roll it and roll it until I'm assigned. Once I'm assigned, I'm now going to turn around and sell a call above my cost basis again and again, and it's going to roll and roll and roll until I'm assigned. So this slide here starts off um, assuming that I got assigned. So this several, several months ago, um, I was assigned 100 shares of Amazon at $115. When you factored in all the premium I collected from those puts, because remember, I sold puts at that 115 strike, keeping the premium. That actually lowered my cost basis to $106.37. So that meant, hey, as soon as I am back uh, to selling a call above my cost basis, I'm going to do it. 
And so in this table down here, you'll see when I uh, decided to sell, what I decided to sell. So in April 21st, uh, Amazon was trading around $106. And that was not a coincidence. That was my trigger. I said, look, I'm pretty much right at my cost basis. So let me go out in distance from my cost basis and let's pick a strike. Um, I happened to pick the 115 strike, which coincidentally was what I was assigned at, which makes some of this calculation of profits all a wash because uh, those 100 shares I bought for $115 and I'm going to send them back for $115. So the only thing I have to keep track of is all of the premium that I collect along the way. So I looked out and I sold um, basically a call at $115. I collected $1.65. So you're like, no, oh, good job. That was $165. Uh, okay. But remember, that was at $115 strike, which is above my cost basis. So I'm going to keep my premium of $165. Plus, my profit is also that delta from $106.37 to 15 times 100 plus the 165. Now, my strategy is remember, I'm going to make caller or the, the holder of those options call those away from me. So as we were kind of going through, uh, originally they were a May expiration. We started getting into May. May 10th uh, it was probably about a week and a half to expiration. I had not been assigned and I said, you know what? I'm going to roll it forward. So what that meant is I bought back my May expiration call and I sold a June expiration call, keeping the same strike. Now, at this time, Amazon was at $110. Still not in the money for my strike, but closer to at the money. So in this case, I collected more premium, uh, actually $200. So now I've got my $165. Now I got $200 more. And time goes on. Uh, it was about two weeks later. I kind of looked at the, the option premiums, and I'm kind of getting a little bit more you know, right at the money. And so this was probably a little bit early. I probably should have waited a little bit longer. But on May 23rd, we were right at my strike, about $115. And I said, you know what? I'm going to close this June expiration out and I'm going to roll it forward to July. So again, I decided to close it down, sell again, collecting another $215. Nothing has changed about my Amazon shares. I still hold 100 Amazon shares. I just keep writing coupons against those uh, shares saying, you know what, if it ever gets 115, I'll sell them to you for $115 a share. So again, May 23rd, I collected an additional $215. So where we are today, and this is something I'm kind of watching uh, each day, uh, because we're really kind of starting to close in on a potential window to roll this forward. So I'm currently holding July expiration calls at 115. I'm looking to roll those into August because remember, my plan is I'm going to roll and roll and roll until someone forces assignment on me. So I look today on the market um, and I didn't roll, but it's very likely I will tomorrow or sometime next week. So the going rate right now, Amazon's actually at $127, but I can take that 115 strike, I can roll it forward and I can still collect another $200. So let's assume that I have collected that other $200. That brings just on the call premium alone, a total collection that I've had over these, you know, three months so far, uh, four months if you go out through the next one, $780. That's money that cannot be taken away from me that is in my pocket today. And so if I add up that premium there, plus the premium I collected on the put side, after you can consider all that together, my cost basis on those 100 Amazon shares is actually $98.57. That's important because if I go and I sell, or basically if someone assigns me those and I have to sell them, right? That's the contract. That's what I'm obligated to do. The difference at $115, which is where I will sell them for, so I will get paid $115 uh, times 100 by whoever calls them away, the difference between this cost basis, 98.57 and 115 is my profit. Because remember, I was assigned at 115. If I let them go at 115, that's a wash. The only thing left is how much premium did I collect along the way? And if we look at that, 
uh, that will be $1,643 if you include the put premium as well as the call premium, which is pretty nice. Now, you might think, well, maybe I can do better just trading the shares. And you probably can in many cases, because in many cases, if you're trading the shares, you are going to be looking for that swing. You're going to be trying to buy low, sell high, catch the loop. Um, it's going to be much shorter time frame. However, it's going to be a lot more stressful. Um, you're going to have to pay a lot more attention to it. Yeah, sure. Maybe you can put in your stop orders and stuff like that. But what I'm telling you here is this is a beginner's trade. It's boring. I don't ever look at this thing. You know, I put this trade on, it sits there. Uh, I wait a few weeks and then I say, oh, you know what? Let's roll it forward. Let's collect more premium. So let's just assume that I went out and I bought 100, uh, 100 shares at $115, right? That's where I was assigned at. Let's assume there's no premium involved. If that $115 went to today's price of 127 and I sold it today for 127, my profit would be $1,200. You know, that would be pretty good. Uh, but like I said, well, you know, you, you got a little bit more um, stress in there, a little bit more timing, a little bit more paying attention. And look at what I did passively with Amazon, 1,643. I'm actually better than that. Now, there were some terrible times as I'm holding Amazon because during my holding time of Amazon, did it, it got down. It, it got kind of ugly. I mean, we got low 90s. Uh, down there. And did that feel good knowing that I was assigned at 115 and I couldn't sell my calls at that point because it was too low. It wasn't above that cost basis. So yeah, there was a period of time where I was having to hold this stuff and, you know, it wasn't so glamorous, but, you know, I have confidence in these blue chips in the valuations and where they're trading, right? So that goes back to step number one. Uh, when I'm when I'm talking about, you know, what am I looking for is I'm looking for that underlying that I want to own. Like that is such a key part of this strategy is if you're okay owning it and and not just one of those, well, I guess if I had to, I'd be okay. It's, it's no, legitimately, if somebody said, hey, what are you holding? Then you, you know, say the name of your underlying. If you're like, I'd be cool in that conversation to be, to say that, then you know what? It doesn't really matter as much as, you know, how low does that go? Uh, because, this is a really a set it and forget it type trade. You force the buyer of the option to put the shares to you to begin with. So think of it like a limit order, but you're getting paid to wait for your limit order to be hit. Um, you don't have to do at the money. You can pick the strike price you want to be assigned at. So for example, maybe Amazon's trading at $110, but you said, you know what, For uh, I'd buy it at 90. Well, you know what you do? You just sell the 90 put. Now, you won't collect as much premium because that's pretty far out there. Um, but if that's what you want to pay for Amazon, then sell that put and, and wait for your assignment. Now, if you're not getting assigned or maybe the option stays out of the money, then, you know, wait for it to expire. Sell the next month out. Roll it within that last week, you know. Sell another one. Keep the same strike. Keep that going. And it's that constant drip, drip, drip through the premium that really will end you up at this kind of collection of, of premium that comes over time of this, you know, $165, another $200, another $215. So you can see right here, this Amazon trade was kind of netting me once I was able to start rolling the call, you know, a $200 premium a month. To put that into perspective, I, I think the buying power on the account to hold these 100 shares of Amazon uh, is is somewhere in the vicinity of thirty one hundred thirty two hundred dollars uh, on my account, and so collecting two hundred dollars against that is about a six and a quarter percent return on that buying power hold uh, every month, and that's little. It doesn't doesn't seem like that impressive, um, but that's the type of thing that adds up. I mean, I mean, six and a quarter percent monthly is not too shabby because that turns into an annual. Uh, percentage return of 75%. Now, is that really sustainable here? No, because probably at some point, uh, Amazon, I'm going to get assigned uh, and then I got to start over again. And there was a period of time where I couldn't actually sell those calls uh, because I was waiting because my cost basis got too low because Amazon dropped too far. 
But in a pure sideways movement stock, and, and even if the stock's going up, I mean, look here at my most recent one here. Even if I rolled today, Amazon's trading at $127. That's well above the 115 strike, and I can still collect $200 in premium. And so this wheel strategy is, is really about very stable, um, boring, for, for lack of a better term, type of trading. And I believe this is extremely beginner focused because most beginners are pretty comfortable buying and holding stock. I mean, if you look at the types of trades that people put out there, you know, buying and holding is pretty much what the majority of your average retail trader does. They hear about some stock in the media. They hear about some family member talking about some stock. They see new company, something like that. And they say, oh, yeah, yeah, I could buy those. And they buy and hold. They have their retirement accounts, their 401ks, and they're buying and holding ETFs. They're buying and holding mutual funds. So buy and hold is a very, very comfortable thing for a lot of people. And the wheel or the covered call is effectively the same thing as buying and hold except what you're doing is saying, you know what? You're putting a for sale sign on those shares that says, I will sell them for this price, you know, if you guys want. And in order to get that price, they have to buy a little subscription fee to it to, to be able to get that, that honored price. Now, risk and reward with anything, the lower the risk, uh, the lower the volatility, the lower your profit. So are you likely to leave money on the table with this strategy? Absolutely. Um, like I said, Amazon could just rip up uh, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 percent uh, from where it is, and you'll be obligated to sell at whatever strike price you picked, and you're only going to keep the premium uh, from that strike price plus the difference that you are above your cost basis. That's your max profit. So if Amazon starts ripping to the moon, you know, you're going to leave that money on the table. Now, the flip side is if Amazon doesn't go anywhere and just trades sideways, trades down, you keep all that money and you just rinse and repeat. And so it's it's really a trade-off of turning in some of those potential gains, those maximum potential gains for less volatility, less thrashing, less stress in your holdings. And that's why I think it's a very good beginner's trade because as a beginner, you're actually going to be trading options, but you're going to be trading options in a very, very risk-controlled aspect. Uh, you're going to see the price movement of an option. You're going to learn and, and see a lot of what the Greeks do, and you're going to do it in a way that's real to you because it's a real holding, but it's, um, you know, it's it's not like paper trading where it's like, oh, that's all imaginary because it's, it's real equity that you have on the line that you put in the game. Um, and, but it's kind of safer uh, because you're not going to go, you know, these violent ups or violent downs to lose tons of money because, you know, you didn't have this covered. Uh, without owning those shares, if you sell that covered call and that stock rips up, you know, 50, 60 percent, you're on the hook for selling those shares at that, say, 115 strike. If you don't have them, guess where you got to go? You got to go to the market to buy them. And if Amazon's trading at, say, $200 a share, you got to buy 100 shares at $200 to turn around and sell them to the guy uh, for 115 And that's that's really where a lot of the the danger or, or risk comes from the options uh, is really when you're, you're not kind of protected on that upside. Uh, with a covered call, that's completely protected where you're not going to lose all that money. Um, what you lose is the opportunity to have sold them at $200 uh, because you are capping your gains at whatever strike you decide to sell on those shares. So that brings us to the end of this week's content. Uh, I hope you guys found that somewhat interesting. Um, like I said, I really feel that this covered call is the most basic and entry level of, of any sort of option premium selling that anybody can get into. And it's really because it is based on that comfortable hold and equity mentality and, and foundation. Most people are comfortable with that. The only part you're adding in is you're selling an option. So you're getting your exposure to the option world but you're doing so in a very controlled fashion. And so you will know exactly what your profit is if 
you know, those get assigned and your premium that you've collected, if you don't and it expires worthless, you still have the shares. And it's so, so important to back to that step one that I pointed out is you have to want to own those shares. So do not do this strategy with something that you do not want to own. Um, like I said, for me, I'm going with blue chips. I'm going with dividend paying stocks. Uh, I'm going with those anchors of a portfolio. I do not like covered calls on high, high, high volatility, you know, IPO, techie, uh, you know, Virgin Galactic or, um, you know, Rivian shares, just basically the, the things that are, are super um, meme and stuff like that. That's, that's not what I like to do covered calls on. I like to do covered calls on very large, stable uh, staples. Uh, now, do I give up some of the premium when I sell those uh, options? Absolutely, because they don't have the same volatility. You know, an Amazon doesn't have the same volatility as a Snowflake uh, or uh, one of those techie type names, uh, which really just has massive volatility. So I'm giving up some of that stuff for that more stability. And it's because, you know, I'm okay holding Amazon. Amazon is a tried and true company. Uh, they have retail business, they have cloud business, they have lots of different anchors, they're diversified. And, and so holding that is is much less stressful to me. Uh, and, and it's something that I would build out in my portfolio anyway. So while I'm holding it, I might as well try to collect some premium along the way. There really are a lot of options like this for these covered type calls. I encourage you to just go out into whatever underlyings you like to hold in your portfolio. Maybe you already have 100 shares of something. You know, I would encourage you to go look at the option chain and and throw a, sell an option against them, right? You're, the worst that you can do, the worst thing that'll happen is you'll get assigned those shares at whatever strike you sold. And as long as you're comfortable with that, as long as that's above your cost basis, you're making a profit, nobody ever got in trouble for making a profit. You know, green is green. Uh, whether or not you make five bucks, 10 bucks or 15 bucks, you're, you're increasing your wealth. You're, you're building your capital. You're building that future for yourself. So, you know, go out there, find your underlyings, try some of this covered call stuff. It's a drip, drip, drip. I think you'll be happy with it. You'll get exposure to the option world. Um, and it'll be a learning experience for you. Lots of things out there to dabble in. Lots of ones you can do this. Just always remember, think outside the block.